Hello, Bay Ridge. Welcome to another edition of After Hours. Today, as I mentioned on Sunday, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the Bible as the Word of God and why we believe the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. We speak that and say that, as I mentioned in our catechism, we refer to uh, God's Word as the Bible, uh, the Bible as His Word. Why is it that we believe this? What, why do we believe that the Bible is actually the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God? Well, there are several reasons. Number one, that's actually what the Bible claims to be, and it's important that we understand this. There are some who want to act as if, well, the Bible didn't really claim that. That's not true. As I mentioned on Sunday, Second Peter, I mean Second Timothy three sixteen, all Scripture is God breathed. Uh, some translations say given by inspiration of God, but it does not mean, that word does not mean inspired in the sense of it makes me feel certain emotions. It's not about the reader is inspired, it's the writing that is inspired. And it doesn't mean that it's inspired as in being inspirational, they're having some kind of high thoughts. It means that the word is literally to be spirited or breathed by God. The picture that Paul is building in 2 Timothy 3.16 is that God exhaled through humans and the product was the written word of God. Peter says the same thing as I mentioned on Sunday in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where he said, No prophecy of Scripture ever had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Scripture is men speaking by God's Spirit. And it's not just those couple of New Testament verses, they're reflecting on what's there in the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets all claim to speak the word of God. The word of the Lord came to me. The Lord spoke through me, we read. Um, Jesus tells us in Mark 12, 36, that David was speaking by the Holy Spirit. In all of these ways, Scripture claims to be God's word. And this is important because if it is God's word, if God was actually speaking to human beings so that what is written down is the word of God, then that means it has to be inerrant because God does not lie. It's not about that humans can't lie. Human beings do lie, but, but the scripture says that God does not lie. He cannot lie. So because the Bible is God's word, it is flawless. It has no error. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 says, every word of God is flawless. When you and I say something, you may record what I say accurately, but I may be mistaken. But God has told us in his word that the that the, the Bible is the inspired word of God, and God does not speak error. He speaks flawlessly. Now, some would say, well, this is circular logic, but of course, we have to begin here. If the Bible didn't claim to be the inspired, inerrant word of God, then there would be no cause for saying that it is. But actually, the Bible does claim to be that. And that is the most important thing, because if God has, in fact, revealed himself in and through his word, that is the standard. Everything else must meet that. But God has also given corroborating evidence to point to this fact. Let me give uh, several things. Number one, the Bible is full of promises and prophecies that are fulfilled. As I mentioned, you know, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 that the whole of scripture is pointing towards Jesus Christ promises and prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. Everything from the fact that it was going to be the seed of a woman that would come forth, that there would be a virgin that would conceive, uh, that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. All of these different things in the Word of God point towards the coming of Christ, and they were all fulfilled. Also, many other things, even in the Old Testament, about other things that uh, Judah was going to be conquered by Babylon, that the northern tribes were going to be conquered by Assyria, but Assyria would fail in trying to conquer Judah. That when Judah would go into exile in Babylon, it would last 70 years. That the Persians were going to come behind them. A man named Cyrus was going to give a decree to free uh, the Jews from Babylon. All of these are prophecies that happened before the time that are fulfilled. Um, there's many prophecies regarding Israel in our history that we can look through and see. So both prophecies regarding the coming of Jesus, prophecies regarding Israel and her history and even world history, and then also very clearly in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 13 and in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus makes clear prophecies regarding the destruction of Jerusalem 
and the destruction of the temple, which was accomplished in 70 AD. Uh, these prophecies were about specifically that event that was going to happen. Um, it's alluded to in the book of Hebrews and in other places, and it's very interesting. Some want to say, well, those are prophecies written after the fact, but they don't actually say, and this came to be passed. They're, they're, they were things that Jesus was stating were going to happen in the future, and in fact, they did come to pass. Thirdly, there's a reality that not only does the Bible claim to be the inspired and errant word of God, not only does it show us that there are fulfilled prophecies, but God has miraculously preserved his word for us. Now, why I say this is there are so many manuscripts of the Bible, and they are so close in time to the original event. Uh, no other document can claim anything like this. I love reading, you know, ancient uh, sources and documents. Uh, you know, this uh, past summer, I reread the Iliad again. The Iliad uh, written by Homer, we only have like one or two copies in the first thousand years. There are thousands and thousands of copies, for example, of the New Testament in that first thousand years. Um, we've seen how the word has been preserved and we're able to even see how accurately it's been preserved. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they took back in time almost a thousand years the copy of the Hebrew text of the Old Testament that we had. But what's been amazing is how consistent it is, how the word was carefully preserved across all of this time. The church itself was miraculously preserved. No one would have bet that the church was going to survive the early persecutions in Rome, but the church is still here. And in the same way, God has preserved his word for his people. So the Bible claims to be the inspired and errant word of God. It's full of promises and prophecies that were accurately fulfilled in history. God has miraculously preserved the word. And fourthly, it's important for us to understand the church has always believed and taught this. The people who lived at the time of the things, the apostles, they claimed to believe that they were speaking the word of God. Peter in 2 Peter 3 says Paul's word is the scripture. They understood what it was and what it meant. And those who claim that the church did not believe this before are either ignorant or they're lying. They either don't know what the church has always taught or they're lying about it because it is a very clear record. The church has always believed that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. And it's critical for us to understand this. This is not some new modern thing that came along. The new modern thing is to doubt that the Bible is the word of God. What the church has always stood on is that God has spoken and revealed himself uh, to us in his written word. And then the last uh, thing that I'll mention that's kind of an external reference point for us is archaeological evidence. Uh, there's so much evidence to support the Bible, more than, again, any other ancient document. There are plenty of times that people have thought the Bible was wrong. For example, Luke in the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts uses certain terms to refer to uh, Roman rulers and leaders uh, you know, and, and how the, the, the Roman governmental system worked out. There were people who said, see, Luke is wrong. The Bible's got errors. Well, as they dug and discovered more, they've discovered time and time and time again. No, actually, the Bible was correct. We come to see that it is reliable. It is firm. It is trustworthy. And this is unique. When you look at things like the Book of Mormon and other writings, that is not true. There is no external archaeological evidence to support what they're saying. In fact, everything goes against it. Uh, there are still questions in some places regarding the Scripture, but the Scripture is a very unique book in all of the weight of archaeological evidence and history that goes along to support what the Scripture says. So all of those are reasons we can do it. And as a believer, I want to close with one last reason. It is true that the Bible claims to be the inspired and error. Uh, infallible Word of God. It is true that the Bible is full of promises and prophecies that we can look back and say are fulfilled. It's true that God has preserved that Word for us, that it is what the church has taught and believed, and that there's all this archaeological evidence. But the last thing is, as a Christian, you and I have the Holy Spirit inside us, and the Spirit constantly testifies to this fact. John Calvin and his Institutes uh, stated this, he, he referred to the testimony of the Spirit within us, 
that the Spirit testifies to us as God's children that the Bible is, in fact, the Word of God. And if you're a Christian, you understand that. It, it presses in on us uh, all of these things from the outside, but then from the inside, the Holy Spirit is pressing this upon us. And I want to encourage you, listen to that voice of the Spirit. Don't, uh, don't doubt the testimony and witness of the Spirit and all of these other things. Doubt your doubts, because those doubts are in fact not true. Remember at the very beginning, Satan in the garden tempted Eve by saying, has God really said? And that seed of doubt led to the fall. Brothers and sisters, we have the firm testimony of God given to us in the Bible. Again, it is a gift. And I encourage you, hear, believe, and respond, and know that all of this points to the fact that the Bible, God's Word, is a solid foundation for you and me, for our faith, for our understanding, for our lives. I hope you have a great week. And if you know somebody who's struggling with this particular question, maybe you can pass this on to them. Include it in your social media feed or just you know email them with a link uh, to point them towards us and maybe you can help answer their questions. I hope you have a great week. I look forward to us gathering for worship again this Sunday. And as always, I encourage you, come early, stay late, enjoy worshiping together and enjoy fellowshipping with one another. Have a great week. God bless. 